All right, well, this morning uh, we're going to uh, look at um, the final commandment uh, of the Ten Commandments, which are a summary of everything the Lord would have us to do. Now, we haven't actually had a chance to look at all the applications of all these commandments. We're simply focusing on them as uh, a reminder, a refresher of what it is the Lord calls us to do, what He calls us to be like. Uh, it, we're looking at it mainly from the perspective of what it teaches us on how to love God and how to love our neighbor and how to love God by loving our neighbor. Okay, so love is a summary of this. This is a definition of love. Uh, again, we're going to round all this off in this evening's message. This morning we're going to look at the 10th commandment, which I'll read for you now in verse 17. The Lord says, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Um, may the Lord bless uh, his word to our understanding this morning. Now, as we've looked at these commandments, uh, again, we can look at them from varying perspectives, but one perspective that we don't want to miss is the fact that each one of these commandments actually gives us a glimpse, not only into what the Lord wants each of us to be like, but into what our Lord Jesus was actually like, what kind of a person he was, what kind of a life that he lived. Remember, um, Sinclair Ferguson on Wednesdays as we've been going through this series has pointed out the reason why Jesus was the way that he was is because of the Spirit's work in his life. The Spirit sanctified Jesus from the very beginning as he created the human nature of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. He made him holy, he made him pure, he made him exactly what the Lord originally intended us to be, but we actually fell from uh, in the garden. As Jesus grew, the Spirit continued to teach him and to guide him and to give him the desire to walk with his Father. He prepared him to be our Redeemer. Now, let me just note this. I mean, sometimes we think Jesus was the way that he was merely because he's the Son of God in human flesh. But we do need to remember that it was the Spirit's work in his life that made him what he is. Yes, it's true that that person is the person of the eternal Son of God and that makes him infinitely worthy and precious. But we also need to remember that Jesus, when he came into this world, didn't really know anything and he had to actually learn and to grow in wisdom and he also grew in favor with God. That's what we're going to look at this evening. But that was the work of the Spirit of God in his life, making him to be what it is we are called to be in the Lord. Now Jesus did the work that he did so that he might give to us his Holy Spirit so that the Spirit might do that same work in us, that he might actually create that same character in us that he created in Jesus. Now what is it that we have learned then up to this point about Jesus, the one whose image the Spirit of God is working in our souls? Well, we've learned that Jesus was completely devoted to his Father. He loved him with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength. He loved him most of all, and he wanted to please him in everything that he did and please him more than any other. We've learned that Jesus worshipped him with his whole life, that the only thing that was a concern of Jesus was how he might honor his Father in doing the things that would please him. That's what it means that Jesus actually grew in favor with God, as again as we're going to look at this evening. We've seen that Jesus kept every single promise that he ever made to his Father, and he treated his Father and his name with the utmost respect. We've learned that Jesus walked every day in his Father's presence, knowing his Father was with him, seeking to honor him and all these things, but particularly he enjoyed the opportunities that he had to spend a whole day with his father, to be able to set aside perhaps the work of the other days and to spend it with, with his father, to spend it with his people on his Sabbaths. We learn that Jesus respected the authority that his father had ordained, that he had placed in every area of society and he gave honor to whom honor was due in his home, his parents, 
in the church and in the state. We saw that he cared about those who were made in his image, and he did everything he could to protect their lives. I mean, what is it that Jesus did as he was going around uh, Palestine in his ministry? He was feeding people. He was healing people. Now, he did those things, of course, to prove who he was so that they would listen to him. That's what it was predicted Messiah would actually do. So it was like his, um, his credentials were being shown for everybody so that they might see and know that he was Messiah. But why did he use those kinds of miracles? Why didn't he just produce a bird out of thin air, make it fly away, or do things that didn't benefit people? It's because he was loving his neighbor at the same time. And he was protecting their lives, feeding them, healing them, but he was especially protecting their lives by sharing the gospel with them. Because a person may be healthy and well, uh, and well provided for their entire lives, but the greatest danger is ahead unless they repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything that they enjoyed in life is actually going to work against them in the end. So you don't do anybody any favors if you just take care of their physical needs. You've got to take care of their spiritual needs as well, and that's exactly what Jesus did when he went around preaching the kingdom of heaven, preaching the gospel. We saw that Jesus kept himself pure in his thoughts and his conduct, and he did everything he could to promote purity in his neighbor. If you read the Gospels, you'll see that is absolutely true. And he never took anything that belonged to anyone else, but instead took what he had and used it to minister to others, to meet their needs. He gave away his time, his resources, his, his gifts to meet needs. And we saw that Jesus... When he spoke, always spoke to bless others. He made sure that his words built them up. And even when he did have to criticize, and there were times when he did, he never unnecessarily criticized anyone, but always had a good reason behind it, even in his reproach against the Pharisees for their hypocrisy. Jesus loved his father, and he loved his neighbor perfectly, and he continued to do that throughout his life, but especially when he went to the cross in order that he might lay down his life so that he might give the Holy Spirit to us so that we might trust in him, so that we might follow him. Now this morning, let's consider one final thing that was true about Jesus and of course, being true about Jesus, one more thing, one final thing, the Spirit of God is desiring to make true also of us. Jesus found everything that he needed to satisfy the desire of his soul in his relationship with his father. And so he was never envious of what other people had. Again, we read in Exodus 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male servant, or his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Jesus kept that commandment. And the reason he was able to do that was because he found everything he needed in his relationship with the Father. So let's look at two things this morning. The Lord teaches us about love in this commandment. First of all, that we are not to desire what the Lord gives our neighbor. But secondly, that we are to be content with what he has given us. So first of all, we are not to desire what the Lord gives our neighbor. That's what the commandment actually tells us, not to covet, which means to desire or to crave what those around us actually have. Now, as I was thinking of what example I might use from the Bible of this, I, 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 there's one that sort of works in a number of instances because so many commandments were broken in this one particular sin, this sin that marked one of the most wicked kings of Israel, if I were to ask you who was the most wicked king in Israel, you should know his name very well. His name was Ahab. Okay, Ahab had a very lovely wife by the name of Jezebel, who was the most wicked queen who ever lived in Israel. And both of them met a very tragic end because of their sins. Well, Ahab is a great example of what not to do. On one occasion, Ahab wanted... Nabus Vineyard. You know, this, this idea of Nabus Vineyard comes up quite a bit. And he wanted this vineyard because it happened to be right next to his own house. And so he offered to buy it, but Naboth 
declined. It was a part of his family's inheritance. God forbid that I should give you what belongs to my father's or even sell it to you. And so how did that affect Ahab when he couldn't have what he wanted? We read about it in 1 Kings 21 verse 4. So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father's. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and ate no food. Now again, remember who we're talking about here. This is uh, the king of Israel. He had a lot. But the only thing he was concerned about was what he didn't have, and that was Naboth's vineyard. So much so, he, he basically prostrates himself on his bed and is crying, crying about it. Okay. Well, Ahab was so consumed by his desire for that vineyard, he couldn't really think of anything else. And so Jezebel thought she would help him out. She hires two worthless men to make false accusations against Naboth, to break the third commandment by bearing false witness. Well, actually, it's breaking the ninth commandment there too, isn't it? Bearing false witness against your neighbor, but calling God to bear witness to an oath that Naboth cursed God and the king and so should be put to death so that Ahab could have this vineyard and his lust could be satisfied. But we do need to understand there was a cost involved to this desire and this method of getting what it is he wanted. That, well, this desire led to the murdering of Naboth and Ahab was the one who was guilty of it because he was the one who had him executed under these false uh, pretenses. This proved to be his undoing. This is how the Lord responded in verses 17 through 19. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who was in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Have you murdered and also taken possession? And you shall speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the dogs will lick up your blood, even yours. Now, consider what, what Ahab had done. Ahab had made, he desired this, this vineyard so much that he was no longer concerned, although I can't say he was concerned probably at any time, to do what the Lord had called him to do. He wanted it so much, he was willing to let these men falsely accuse his neighbor. He was willing to murder his neighbor in order that he might have it. And because he was willing to do this, this vineyard, his desire for this vineyard, actually destroyed him. It destroyed his life. Now, I bring that up simply to say this. When our desire for something become stronger than our desire to honor the Lord, we have made an idol out of that thing, whatever it may be. We love it more than the Lord. That's why Paul writes to the Colossians in Colossians 3 verse 5, that evil desire, greed is idolatry. He says this, therefore consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. I believe in the King James it's, it's covetousness. When you desire things, that is idolatry because you're elevating that thing and your devotion to that thing, your desire for that thing, above your devotion and your desire to serve the Lord and to honor Him. James tells us that greed, jealousy, selfishness are not what the Spirit of God is working within our hearts. It is a part of the old man. It's a part of that original corruption we have, that sin nature that we are to put to death. We are not to nurse those things in us, those desires. We are to kill them because they are evil. James writes in chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder and every evil thing. I think we've seen 
a good example of that in Naboth. By the way, he says it's demonic. He says it is the, of the nature of the demons, the nature of the devil. What was Satan's downfall? Satan's downfall was jealousy, selfish ambition, greed, covetousness. He wanted to exalt his throne over God. He wanted to have more power, more authority than God had. And this is what caused his rebellion, and this is what caused his downfall, moving basically from the most perfect creature that God ever made, the greatest of all his creation, basically, into that which was the most wicked of all beings. The Lord says, you shall not covet what belongs to your neighbor. Now, it's not wrong if your neighbor has something that you think would be useful to have and there's another one that's available and you can afford to get one, then by all means. I mean, sometimes when we get things and, you know, we, we see that thing and we say, hey, that's really a useful thing. You know, I think I'll get one for myself. That, that's not what we're talking about. There's nothing wrong with that. If you want it because you have to have that one, or because you can't stand the idea that this person has something that I don't have because I need to keep up with the Joneses, as it were, that's coveting and that's sin. And when you do that, you're not loving your neighbor. And when you do that, you're also not loving God. Now, instead of being envious of what other people have, we should really be thankful that the Lord has blessed them in the way that he has and we should desire that the Lord might bless them even further if it's pleasing to Him. Now again, think about the Lord Jesus. Can you think of one instance in the Gospels where He ever expressed a desire for what somebody else had? Well, no, He didn't because love, godly love, the kind of love the Spirit of God works in our hearts is the opposite of jealousy and selfishness. Paul tells us about it in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 7. Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Now, if you have this, this kind of love, you're not going to be covetous, or at least you're not going to have, and we're all going to be tempted to, be, uh, to covet at one time or another, but we do need to, to kill that desire and put on this kind of love and let it be built up in our hearts so that we would not desire what other people have. This is really the key, as, as I mentioned before, to keeping all the commandments. Remember that Jesus gave us His Spirit to work this kind of love in us. So don't desire what your neighbor has. Be thankful for what God has given to your neighbor and desire that the Lord might even bless them more, particularly that He might give them His Spirit so that if they don't have the Spirit, they might come to know Him. But let's look at the second point, which is instead of being envious of what others have, to be content with what the Lord has given to us. Now, we need to see that contentment doesn't come from getting what we don't have, but it comes from being satisfied with what we do have. Now, we should be satisfied because the Lord has given us a lot. Uh, before we look at this, I just want to consider, we've already seen that um, a lack of contentment, covetousness, and so forth can turn into idolatry. It can, it can be the breaking of the first commandment. Being envious and greedy is the same as idolatry. And putting the desire for something other than God above our desire for God. Um, God doesn't satisfy us, so we begin to look for something else that will. And when that happens, we've broken the first commandment, which tells us that we should have no other gods. We shall have no other gods before the true God, which means we must be completely devoted to Him. But let's note for just a moment that discontentment is actually at the root 
of the breaking of all the commandments, even as love, which ultimately brings contentment, is really the, uh, you might say, the root behind our obedience to all the commandments. Now, think about this. Why would we ever want to worship the Lord in a way other than what He has called us, in, in the way that He's called us? Why would we ever want to live in a way other than the way the Lord calls us uh, to live? The only reason I can think of is because we're not satisfied with what we can have on that particular path, and what we want means we have to get off the path, which means dissatisfaction takes us off the path of obedience. Why would we ever want to break the promises we have made to the Lord? Promises in our marriage, promises in our, in our church membership, to follow the Lord, to walk in His ways, to love Him, to serve Him, and everything it calls us to do. Could it be that it would be that by, break, or by keeping these commandments or, or these promises, we would not be able again to get exactly what we want? And isn't this why we sometimes struggle to keep the Lord's day holy? Because we're not satisfied with spending the day with God. There's something else we want, and the only way to get it is by not spending the day with Him. And so discontentment leads us again to sin. Or our decision not to obey authority, which the Lord has placed over us. Why would we not listen to what they tell us when they're telling us the things we should be doing? Isn't it because there's something we can't get? if we submit to them, but we can get it if we break or don't honor what it is they're telling us. Discontentment will move us to break the commandments. Why do we sometimes want to hurt other people? Isn't it because when we get hurt, we're not going to be satisfied until we get even with them? Doesn't sexual s sin also stem from the very thing? Because we're unwilling to wait until we're married for this particular blessing the Lord intends for marriage, or in the case of adultery, we're not content with our spouse and we want someone else. A lack of contentment with the Lord's plan and His will or with what He has given to us leads us to break the commandment. And obviously, doesn't every theft begin with discontentment? Doesn't it begin with covetousness? I'm not happy because I don't have that thing. I want that thing. When we withhold our gifts or our times or you know, the time that we have to serve the Lord or our resources from Him, isn't it because we're not happy or content with what it will cost us personally if we do give of our time and service to the Lord? And again, when you stop and think about it, bearing false witness against your neighbor, bringing false charges, using your words to tear down rather than build up, doesn't that also spring from a desire for revenge? We're not content until we get even. Now, all of that was just simply to say discontentment is at the root of all of the sins that we commit, basically, because it's not the way we want it to be. Now, if that's true, then the only way we can possibly overcome our sins is to be satisfied with what the Lord has actually given us. In other words, to be content with His plan, with His purpose, with His rules, and agree with Him that this is the best way to do it. Now, how can we be content with what the Lord has given to us? Well, the only way we can really is to be able to see what it is He has given to us. Once we see what we have through the Lord Jesus Christ, what the Lord has given to us. He's actually given us Himself. We have a relationship with the God of creation. Well, that should content us, I think. The author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 13, verse 5, make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have. Why should you be content? For He Himself has said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. You see, you have a treasure that is far greater than, than anything that you might possibly get by breaking the commandments, by, as it were, getting off the path, or as some people consider it, I think, if, who don't love the law of God, they consider it a cage that I've got to break open and get out of so I can get what I want. Well, why would you want to do that when God is in the cage, as it were, when God is on the path? When he says he's going to walk with you, 
He's going to take care of you. He's going to love you. He's going to provide everything that you need. You know, God is a greater treasure than anything in this world. Through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the forgiveness of sins. That's what's in the cage. That's what's on the path. He saved you from hell. You probably noted in, in the prayer that I was, you know, we had a little bit earlier, sort of a reflection upon hell. Hell is a real place. Hell is a place, the Bible says, there's darkness, there's weeping, there's gnashing of teeth, there is fire, there's burning, there's torment. It's not, you know, just a little bit beyond bearable. It is torment, which is very painful. Uh, Joseph Bellamy, who was... Um, uh, one of Jonathan Edwards' disciples in, in a certain sense in those days, uh, uh, an established minister would have somebody come in and sort of basically intern under him preparing for the ministry. Joseph Bellamy was a close friend and he was one of those interns who lived with Jonathan Edwards' family for a year. He wrote a book called True Religion Delineated and I believe it was in that book that he says, you know what, hell is much worse than we can even imagine even if it were you know, just the things I've already mentioned. But he says that he believed that in hell, even as in this life all the sins we commit that are not forgiven in Christ, and none of them are if you don't trust in Jesus, all of these sins basically place you at the first level of suffering in hell. But hell is also represented as a bottomless pit that continually descends. And it's not because the worst people are lower and you're higher, but it's because everybody is going down. Because God punishes not only for the sins we commit in this life, but He punishes us for the sins we actually commit when we're in hell. Now that is for a person who is in hell, they continue to sin. They blaspheme, they hate God, they're committing sins, and as they do, their punishment gets worse and worse and worse, and there's nothing they can do ever to escape the downward progression of their punishment and their judgment. Now why do I bring that up? Because through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ your sins are forgiven and you will not be in hell but that is where all of us deserve to be because of Adam's sin when we came into the world and because of all the sins we've committed since we've come into the world. We're not going to see hell if we've trusted Jesus. We're not going to be in that bottomless pit that sinks forever. We will be in heaven, where basically our, our joy and happiness and satisfaction will continually increase as we are lifted up. Heaven's going the opposite direction of hell. The more we learn about God and uh, the more we're going to be blessed, the more He reveals Himself, the more we're going to be blessed. And God is infinite. We're never going to come to the end of learning about Him and seeing His glory. So our blessedness is going to increase throughout all eternity. That's if you see that, if you understand that, and you know that's yours, that is a, a tremendous blessing. Who can put a value on that? What is that compared to money? What is that compared to the things of this world? God has brought you into His family. He's called you His sons and daughters and given you all the rights and privileges that come from being a part of His family. You can address God as your Father and you can ask for what you need and you can know your Heavenly Father will give it to you. He's given you His Holy Spirit to be your constant companion, your provider, your comforter, and your guide. You have the privilege of serving Him here as His ambassadors. We consider people who come in the name of a foreign dignitary to represent that dignitary as having a place of honor. And I think we respect those kinds of people and we admire them. But do you realize that you and I are ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ and we are authorized by Him to represent Him to others and to offer His gospel, entrance into His kingdom to whoever we see? We are those ambassadors. And He is going to reward you for this, not only in this life for what you devote to Him, what you give to Him, but He's also going to reward you forever in heaven. And when your time in this world is over, He will come and He'll take you home. And He will love you and He will care for you forever in that world of pure blessedness and peace and joy and hope and love. Now what is there in the world that can really compare to this? There's nothing. So why should we, having 
this treasure. Be envious of, of anyone or anything. Why, why should those things have really any appeal to us at all beyond what we need actually to live and serve the Lord? You know, the Bible actually summarizes everything we need outside of the Lord Jesus Christ to two things. And Jesus even promises that he will provide for those things if we will serve him. And those two things are food and covering. Food and covering. It's all we need. Food to sustain us, covering to protect us. Um, and I think that probably includes the housing in which we live as well. Food and covering. And that should be enough for us because if we have Christ, we have everything else we need. Paul, again, we saw this uh, writing to Timothy earlier in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 to 11. Let me read this again. But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. If we have food and covering, with these we shall be content. But those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge men into ruin and destruction for the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Uh, let me stop there just for a moment. Does anybody here want to get rich? <laughs> How many of you really want to get rich? Well, this do you believe that what Paul says here is true? I wonder how many of us really believe this. If we did, we wouldn't be pursuing money or those kinds of things, but we would pursue the things of the Lord. He goes on to say, but flee from these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Are you pursuing those things instead? Because these are the things that actually are profitable for us. Remember, you can't take it with you. Again, when have you ever seen a hearse behind, or I say, a, you know, like a U-Haul behind a hearse? People cannot take it with them. Even though the pharaohs built these great pyramids and they put all these riches and all this food and everything else inside the pyramid, thinking when they went to the afterlife they would have all these things, centuries later, those items are still inside the pyramid because you can't take anything out of this world. Whatever the rich and the famous have now, one day they're going to have to leave it all behind. But whatever we have, you know, whatever the Lord has given to us and whatever we get from Him by way of reward, we get to keep it forever. We will never lose it. Everything we give to the Lord is something we get to take out of this world and keep forever. Only those things we give to the Lord we get to keep forever. So the point is, don't be envious of what your neighbor has. You have no reason to be, really. Be happy for what the Lord gives to them. Desire better things for your neighbor, especially that they might come to know Him. That's the greatest blessing that we can desire for anyone uh, so that they might know the blessings that we also enjoy. You have far more than the richest unbeliever on earth. As a matter of fact, the, the greatest and richest man who ever lived you have far more than they do if they were an unbeliever. And you are a believer. You have far more through the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, the more you can see that, the more you can grasp what it is the Lord has given to you, the less you'll be tempted to be discontent and envious, and the less you'll have reason, really, to sin. It takes away your desire to break away from what the Lord calls you to do. You can stay on the path because what you have on the path is much better than what's off the path. Now let me just close by saying this, that if you haven't received these blessings, may the Lord grant you that you might through His Spirit. It's only when you believe these things to be true, and really you, you, you can believe it in a certain sense apart from the work of the Spirit of God, but you really need the Spirit to open your eyes to these things, to see that they are real. If you haven't received them, may the Lord open your eyes by His Holy Spirit and give you the grace to come to Jesus, to turn to Him, to trust Him, and to receive this blessing, these riches this morning. You realize that 
Jesus has done all this so that everyone who believes in him would receive these things. And he actually offers them to you this morning and he tells you to come. He wants you to come. Come to him in order that you might receive these blessings, in order that you might be content, that you might be filled, that you might be satisfied. Jesus is the only one who actually can do that. Nothing in this world can ever satisfy. And again, I'll just point your, you know, again, by way of example, whatever it is you've ever wanted that you were just consumed with because you couldn't have it and then you actually received it, how long is it before that thing becomes almost worthless to you? The reason why it does is because it's, it's limited, it's finite, the, the joy, the happiness, the satisfaction it gives can only take you so far and then it's no longer that important. The only thing that satisfies forever, the only thing that can satisfy is the one who is infinite. And there's only one who is, and that's God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's the only one who can ultimately satisfy you. So if you want satisfaction, that is the only place you will ever find it. And Jesus is willing to give it to you if you are willing to come to him and trust in him and turn from your sins and follow him. Well, may the Lord give you the grace to do that and the rest of us the grace to be content. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us uh, do that.